Hi, my name is Dan Zeilinger, and I have been a world traveling full time trad jazz musician for the past 40 years. Some of my most memorable performances were on the lawn of Edinburgh Castle at Imperial Palace in Japan, as well as TV shows and commercials across the world. I've met many people during my career and have spent many hours on stage and off with these musicians, talking about jazz, life, and more. Some are touring musicians, some are theme park warriors, and some are casual musicians who play on the weekends with friends. I think they all have stories worthy of a movie script. And through these interviews, I'll be sharing them with you. Hi there, this is Dan Zeilinger on Trad Jazz Today. My guest today is, uh, it's an old friend of mine. We've, uh, we've been playing in Dixieland bands and theme parks and uh, bar mitzvahs and whatever we could get together in whatever style we had to play together. Uh, my, my friend and, and wonderful drummer, Mr. George Andrus. Hey, George. Hey, Dan. Thanks yeah, we've we played a little bit of everything together, haven't we? You know, we did Dixieland and surf music and... <laughs> whatever else we could get paid for. Yeah, we got paid. Dan. Which is kind of the thing to do. Yeah. Uh, so let me, let me, uh, so you were actually born, were you born in Garden Grove? No, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I didn't know that. See, that's something that's not online. Okay. That you're moved out here uh, when I was about six or seven. You're actually, I think, a year younger than I am. You were born in 55, right? Yeah, I was 65 last month. Let's well, see. May, May 23rd. Yeah. No, you're, you're old. Uh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> no, you're only as young as your uh, yeah. as your knees are. So, okay. So, uh, um, how old were you when you made the move to California? I think I was six or seven years old because I was in when we moved out here. I was enrolled in kindergarten right away in Garden Grove. So we moved. So moved you, out you virtually have no memory of. I have some memories that it was it was really cold. <laughs> <laughs> In the winter, you know that is amazing, uh, amazingly similar theme to several people, a uh, Phil Andreen, for example. Oh, okay. Uh, he was back east, and and one day the snow got co covered, car got covered with snow, and his parents said, "Let's go." And same thing with um, uh, Flip Oaks. Oh. Flip Oaks was from back east, and his dad was a long haul truck driver, oh, and they okay. were shoveling snow off of their car one day. And his wife said, uh, when you get back from this trip, I want to move to California. And he said, we're not moving to California until you sell the house. Oh, he gee. got back from that trip and she had sold the house. Oh, gosh, you got to be kidding. <laughs> so, so you guys coming out to a warmer weather is not, is yeah. not the... Yeah, my dad and my, dad and my grandfather, um, it was interesting history in Ohio. They built the uh, first drive-in restaurant in the state of Ohio. Oh, really? And, what was it called? And the, it was called the Andrus Drive-In. And it had the roller skater, you know, hot, hot sure. so go out to the car. And then it, my grandfather built an adjacent miniature golf course. And in around 1948 or 49, I think it was, my dad said that the McDonald's company, uh, uh, what's his name, Ray Kroc? Well, Ray Kroc was the CEO after he bought yeah. it off of the McDonald brothers. Yes. He offered my, my uh, grandfather the first McDonald franchise. And my grandfather didn't want to do it. So that my dad, at that point, my dad wanted to get out of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> and McDonald's followed him. That's right. Yeah, and he followed him. Yeah. So that's crazy. So, uh, so yeah, so I grew up in Garden Grove, California. Okay. And uh, when did you start playing music? I, you know, I got interested in it um, at, at, at home at a really early age, even when we lived in Cleveland, Ohio, because my, both my mom and dad were into the early swing music. Mm. And they had, my dad had the entire collection of Glenn Miller on this, in this booklet of 45s. And they sure. used to play it, and I used to pull out the pots and pans, you know. <laughs> now, did they play anything? And bang, yeah. my dad played the boogie woogie piano. Oh, okay, so yeah. kind of a big, tiny little type guy. And, that, and that's how he met my mom. So he was playing shot pool and played boogie woogie piano in bars. <laughs> wow. So, okay. okay. And then when you got, did you start in elementary school like a lot of us? I, I started a little bit before elementary school. My mom and dad got me um, lessons at a local music store when I was, I think, eight or nine. And then I started in the fourth grade because my mom challenged the school. You know, we weren't supposed to be able to start until the fifth grade. 
but I had already, you know, had some ability on the drum pad and she was able to get me in at the fourth grade. Do you remember your, that, that teacher you had when you were six or seven? I kind of, you know, I was just wondering. Yeah. He was at a, at a music store that was, um, I think it was off of Garden Grove Boulevard, which is, it's not there anymore. And I remember I learned that was my first introduction to reading, you know, reading music sure. and learning, learning rudiments. And then when I was um, a nine years old on my ninth Christmas, my parents bought me my first drum set. Was it decent or? A Ludwig drum set. Well, there you go. That, that, that's a nice thing. Is that one of those little GP Mattel drum sets, you know? No, it was a good drum set. I came, I came out to, to look at all the presents under the Christmas tree. And my two brothers, they were all counting their presents and stacking them. And I didn't have any presents under the Christmas tree. So I was, I started crying. <laughs> and my dad goes, I want to talk to you. And he took me in the back room and there was the drum set. Now your brothers were older, right? Uh, one is younger and one is older. My uh, oldest, oldest brother, John, will be 71 at the end of this month. Now, and when he was younger, he was a big football star in Garden Grove, right? That, that was, what? Jim was. Yeah, I yeah, think you told younger. me that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he set all kinds of school records, and and now he sells alcohol for business. For business. <laughs> so, hey, whatever pays the bills, man. It pays the bills, yeah. You know, especially in this day and age, huh? So they're so they're doing well, and you know, my older brother's retired and living in uh, Medford, Oregon, and Jim lives uh, just at, just outside of Sacramento. Okay, well that's that's cool. Yeah. How, how's your wife? How's Janet? Janet is wonderful. She's a uh, She's at the clubhouse right now where we live at doing pool aerobics. <laughs> well, that's, well, hey, you can't knock that. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, she that's a good deal. Well, you know, I, I know you guys so well. I just wanted to make sure to, yeah. to say hi and give her some creds here. Maybe she'll be home before we're done. We'll see. So. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, tell me, so where'd you go? You went into, you started playing in fourth, fourth grade. Now, fourth see, they grade. let wind players play in fourth grade. Yeah. But, uh, but me, not drummers, huh? No, they let me though. So they let me play snare drum parts. And then, um, let's see, when I, uh, I think I was in the sixth grade, I, I had horrible handwriting in, in elementary I school. still do. So. I, you do? Well, because I had a, a I, I missed the day where they showed how to hold the pencil. And so the next day I came in and a kid that was left-handed showed me how to hold the pencil. And so, Going through like the fifth and sixth grade, all the teachers thought I was incredibly uncoordinated until show and tell one time in sixth grade, I brought my drum set in and I played, I played the song, drum solo from the song In the God of the Vida. Oh, sure. <laughs> By Iron Butterfly. Yes. And at that, at that point, the teacher realized I, had, I didn't have any coordination issues. <laughs> so so, so your, your, your bass drum foot was good even then? It was pretty good, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. that's not an easy solo. That was one of those things I didn't have to work on. <laughs> All right, and, and so let's progress here. So then you got into high school. I got into, well, junior high school. I, I was playing in the um, junior high band. And then I think when I was 12 or, well, before that, I'm jumping ahead time-wise a little bit. Sure, I'm, um, I'm with you. In junior high, when I was 12 or 13, I uh, joined the Lancers Drum and Bugle Corps. Which okay, the was Kingsman the Feeder Corps. Corps for, feeder Corps from the Kingsmen. And, uh, and Mark uh, Hubbard was, was in the, the Lancers with me and Jim Brocky. And, About the same time, do you know who was in the, uh, the Velvet Knights Feeder Corps? Probably Matt Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in fact. Interesting. Well, it's interesting that you and I have a lot of connections to the drum corps thing, too. I mean, uh, Mike Alarcon was my, my, my son's godparent. Yeah, he was a great player too. Man. Oh, and just a, just a nice guy on top yeah, of it nice, all. Nice guy, great player. Man. But yeah, a lot of guys came out of drum corps that don't claim it anymore, you know? Yeah, I, I do. I think it's a great place to come out. In fact, most of the drummers that I like, you know, in the contemporary arena, they all have a, a, a drum corps back. Well, Billy Cobham was a drum corps guy. Billy Cobham, Steve Gadd, uh, um, a bunch, bunch of the guys are. Tommy Igo, who's, uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he... Um, he played at Birdland in New York and okay. he out here in San Francisco with a big band. He's, he's a drum corps guy. And, you know, it gives you, um, there's two things that I really got from drum corps. Num number one was learning how to play and lock in with other players, you know, because when you're in the line, and the, 
you know, no matter what line it is, even the rudimental bass drum line. Yeah, you know, it's life or death. You have to learn, you have to listen to the other guy and lock in, learn that, you know, and then learn all the rudiments, which... Yeah, of course, a lot of people don't understand that that uh, jazz drumming actually came out of rudimental drumming. Absolutely. Yeah, you know? it did. I, the second line drummers, you know, those guys were all rudimental drummers and they were back in the 20s, you know, they were, many of the well-known ones were studying with a drum teacher by the name of George Lawrence Stone. I don't know if you know who he is. He wrote a book um, called Stick Control, which okay. is like for a lot of drummers is like the Bible, you know, still a lot of guys still go through it. And that definitely came out of that, uh, you know, legit kind of drum corps uh, arena. Yeah. No, another good example is that Slauson, of course. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we were in, we were in the Kingsman together. Right. And, and Ed and I were in a Fullerton college uh, a band and orchestra together. I don't know if you knew that. That's no, I didn't, but let's back up to back to high school for a second. Okay. So, so yeah, go let ahead. Let me go back to, let me go back to when I first, first got introduced to, to, to Dixieland. Sure. It's an interesting story. So I was 11 years old and my dad was a supervisor at a lunch truck company called Orange County Food Service, which was located off of Mariloma Avenue in Anaheim. Was that, and, was that the same company Joe Lentz worked for? So did D. D. Wollum. Okay. So D. Wollum worked under my dad. And so D. and Hardy Walker, they had this steady gig at this pizza parlor off of Beach Boulevard called Peepaw's Pizza Parlor. Sure. And my dad and my mom used to take me down there and get me to sit in with the band when I, when I was 11 years old. And because, you know, later on, after talking to Dee and Hardy, Dee told me that the only reason they did it was because Dee was intimidated because he worked for my dad. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> kind of felt obligated to do it. But that was a great introduction to that music. And, and one of the things that I got out of it was that the drummer that they were using at the time was a gentleman by the name of um, uh, Charlie Lotus. I don't know if you know who he is. No. But he was he was in the Pearly Band for years okay. with, with Jack Martin out of Disneyland. And prior to that, he was Pete Fountain and Al Hertz drummer. Okay. And so he had a, he was my first drum teacher, you know. And he was like the master of the press roll. You know, he could he could take a chorus on the press roll, you know, and keep the melody all the way through. <laughs> yeah, accent the press roll, sure. Access accenting it. So yeah. Oh, he, hitting a cowbell or wood block and. Is that old Baby Dodd style? Yeah, yeah, and those, you know, and those are like Baby Dodds and uh, Big Sid Catlett and Charlie Morehouse are probably my, you know, the guys that I listened to. But what's interesting is that, you know, early on when I played Dixieland jazz, I really didn't listen to it much. I mainly played it when my parents took me to the uh, jazz club that was in Santa Ana at the Elks. I don't know sure. if you ever, ever went to that one. Yeah, well, we were listening to the Beatles and stuff. Oh yeah, all you those know. guys. So I was listening to the Beatles, and then I was listening to uh, Steppenwolf. You remember that? Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Genesis was another big influence. So, so I was into the you know the rock and roll stuff. So I had both of those things kind of going on. As I was I was in my first working rock and roll band when I was fourteen. Okay. We were playing high school dances and. You know, and then and then a couple of years later, I um, when I was I think I was 16, I got in a band with a guitarist named Mark Norton, who in 1986 got the Kiss gig. Okay. So he was a lead guitarist for Kiss. He's on, on one of their albums called Animalize, and and so we we were in a band for six years. At the same time, when I was doing the Dixieland gigs, you know, <laughs> so, a little bit of a culture shock from gig to gig. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it was it was uh, interesting times, but. You know, I, I'm, I was looking at some of the questions you wrote down and, you know, I'm looking at the bands that I was in. It's, I don't even know if I remember all of them, you know. I of got, course not. I got to 18 and stopped. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question that was just, you know, a lot of people are really um, uh, wondering what, it, what, what this show's about. And that, that question there was actually just something I wrote up for myself oh, to okay. fall back on. If, if I get stuck for a question or if my memory goes, well, you know, I'm getting older than you are. Well, I know. So, <laughs> That's so, one, and, one and so they took that more and more people were asking, well, you know, what's he going to ask? So my son just kept, keeps sending them out now. Uh, I've actually had some people mail them back to me with the answers. Oh, but, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, I got it's mine up here on the music stand. So. <laughs> but let's, let's talk a little bit more about the Dixie Cats. Now, when you first got that gig, wasn't Scotty Plummer with them? 
Uh, no, when I first got it, it was uh, Chuck Anderson. Sure. Was in that band. And uh, I'm trying to remember his name. It was a, John Nelson. He's a wonderful violin player. He came out of that whole Stuff Smith kind of, you know, and, and Stefan Grappelli school. He's yeah. A really, really wonderful player. And, and we had a variety of different uh, uh, banjo players, but you know, for, for much of that band, we didn't have banjo. We had piano and then trombone. Uh, Charlie Romero was the, was the clarinetist. I don't know if you remember him. Oh yeah. He was a dentist and uh, a bunch of different uh, trumpet players. We had a lot of great trombone players that came through that band, which is really interesting. We had uh, Chuck Anderson, and then we had uh, Al Jenkins. Do you know who he is? Sure. And we had uh, Bobby Anavolsa. That him I don't know. He was a very, he was a great, great player. And then the one that we had that that really had an impact on me was a guy by the name of Buster Buster Cooper. Okay. We were playing a gig in, in uh, Newport at the Red Onion. It was right. Remember that Red Onion? It was right on the harbor. And so we had a steady Sunday gig there. And he subbed for Chuck Anderson when Chuck went out with Harry. Right. Well, Buster was the lead trombone player for Duke Ellington for nine years. Mm -hmm. And when I first met him, he had just gotten off the road with Louis Belson. Okay. And he saw something in my, in my playing and wanted to take me under his wing. But, you know, he was having me, wanted me to drop my girlfriend, wanted me to <laughs> do all this, all this stuff, you know, and, and, and I didn't do it. You know, I went back out on the road uh, uh, probably a month or two later with a funk band up in uh, Seattle, Washington. Called, called I, I don't know if you know it or not, but there's a great um, video clip on YouTube of the Harry James band on the Merv Griffin show. Oh. And they spend a lot of time talking about Chuck because Merv thinks he looks like Tommy Dorsey. And so they're, they're going back and forth about Chuck Anderson. And he's, of course, he's standing there with that grin on his face. Yeah. That, that he has. It's, it's a cool clip. You got to look it up. Uh, Harry James on the Merv Griffin show. Oh, okay. It, yeah, he's a, a great a, guy. Chuck. Yeah. He was such a great guy, you know, and it, I thought about him a lot this week because Janet and I were out um, shopping at one of the uh, antique stores here on Monday. And I was looking through records. I'm always looking for records when I go into a store. I actually found two albums there. One I found was an album that Al Smith, Hal Smith did in the okay. year in the early 80s. So I've got, I, I picked that one up and then I picked up the one that Chuck was on with Harry James that won a Grammy. Okay. Called, called the King's James Version. Have you heard that album? Yes. And so it, for me, it's, it's really fun to listen to it because I, I don't know if we talked about it before, but the drummer that was with Harry James at the time was Lester Merle. And sure. he, was my, he was my drum teacher for five years. Okay. I studied with him. In fact, when I went out on the road with early pop bands, he would mail my lessons to me. <laughs> oh, that's great. So, so well, you've, had, you've had a bunch of uh, uh, really uh, good teachers. I, that much I know. Yeah, I did. I was lucky. I had, I had great teachers and, you know, I got lots of great exposure to other drummers that were, you know, that were really great players. I mean, I had this gig um, when I had, uh, I was a member of the Monarch Jazz Band with Lance Bowler and Ira Nepis and Scotty Plummer and Andrew Fielding, you know, he- Sure, but piano player. Yeah, he's Zeke's Archie's son. Yeah. He just wouldn't take the, the last name, you know? <laughs> and so we had- Probably a, a smart move. Yeah. We <laughs> had this gig at this club in um, Sherman Oaks called Stevie G's. And the band that opened up before us was Heine Bo. Do you remember Heine Bo? It was a very famous club. I remember the name, but I don't know the, the, the band. Yeah, very famous clarinetist. And so he would have great drummers that played with them. And so I'd go early. It would, it would either be Gene Estes, Jay Canna, or Frankie Cap. Oh, know? wow. So, I mean, three great players. So they, I would go they, in. They couldn't find anybody good, huh? No, couldn't find anybody good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, a, it, it was some great times, man. And so I, we had that gig for about a year. With, with Lance. Julie Rubio, I think, was a vocalist. There you go. That, she was, uh, she traveled around with Tiny a lot. Yes, yeah, she did. In fact, I don't know if you know this, I did Big Tiny's last two albums. I remember hearing you say that on one of the other interviews. Yeah. yeah. It's that funny because uh, I just interviewed earlier, I told you, I interviewed Brad Roth, and he, 
And actually, Brad's very first album he did with Tiny. I didn't know that. So it's been kind of a, a running a running gag through some of my interviews. Well, not yeah. gag so much. It's, yeah, Brad, what amazing player. You and know. and you'll you'll be happy to know that uh, uh, I'm going to be dropping an interview soon with Hal. Hal Smith. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. You know, he yeah. has so much knowledge when it comes to the style. And he sure does. I used to always go and see him with. Um, you know, I remember he was uh, in. Oh gosh. What was a gal's name band that he was in for years? I'm trying to remember, she was very popular. Oh, Bandu Gibson. Yeah. In fact, I when when I did the first uh, L.A. jazz um, festival that they did up by the airport. Yep. Bandu couldn't make it because she was pregnant and having a baby, and Hal couldn't make it. And at the last minute, um, I was approached to sub for. For, for Hal. So I went and I played one whole day. Did did all did my set with the Dixie Cats, right? Oh yeah. Richard, Richard Cruz is the one that they contacted me that he was there and he was kind of coordinating things. So. I remember Richard. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, the jazz educa educator out of Fullerton, uh, junior college. Yeah, he both Ed Slauson and I were in his uh, music theory class together. Well there you go. A, a pretty good connection. Yeah. Now I was trying to remember George exactly when it was you and I met. I, I can't remember. I I know that the first gigs we did together were the LA Fair. That's what I thought. Yeah. But I think I probably met you when you were the Dixie Cats. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, not met, hung out, but right. I probably knew we were doing because... the same things. You know, we were playing the same uh, venues and stuff up in Sacramento, especially. You know. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I did Sacramento as much as you did. I I know I've done it ten or twelve times. Yeah. So quite a, quite a few times. And yeah, I was there. I was there a lot uh, between all the different groups I played with, of course. Um, uh, let's so back to let's go back to Dixie Cats for a minute. Who who else came through that band? Oh God! And of course, I I played a circus with Lance Buller for a summer. Yeah, Lance was in it. Uh, Julie Rubio was in it for a while. Um, Gil Cross, piano player. Him, I don't know terrific piano player um after i left john whited did it for a while on oh. drums and good good drummer and uh yeah i i don't know if i can remember everybody i was in it for a long time so yeah you were yeah that i remember I so let's talk it. let's talk about the fair okay because the fair was the gig that launched of course the knots gig but yeah. let's talk about the fair gig and, and the people who went through that job okay well the, you know that was the beginning for me really of learning the style the way it was supposed to be played <laughs> well <laughs> some people's that, opinion of how it was supposed to be played. well i know but i but you know i had the good fortune um i, I know larry did it quite a bit you know and so larry, larry was for playing that hot style which we ended up doing a lot at, at knots right he right. was very influential on me on that and talk about larry right very right. He was yeah. the one that got me listening to, you know, Chauncey Morehouse and, you know, the Bix recordings and, 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 and those sort of things. But we had Chuck Anderson did it. Uh, Bob Reitmeyer, I think, did it. Bob. Yeah. I, what I remember about Bob was, is he would try never to be on stage until the absolute downbeat. <laughs> he actually used to hide behind buildings. Yeah. And just stand there with his case and watch his wristwatch. Or smoking a pipe. <laughs> yeah, smoking his pipe until until the downbeat came. And then he would appear and he'd be on stage right at the downbeat with his clarinet. Yeah, it was great. A, a incredible player. Oh, uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Who else? Amazing player. That was another guy I would go see all the time when I was at the, you know, at the jazz festivals, whenever the yacht club was there. Right. I was always trying to catch their sets with Matt and, and John and Westy, you know. And uh, Westy, gosh, what a great guy. Oh, he's come up in every interview I've done. Westy? Uh -huh. Yeah. He was really influential in my computer career. He used to come over my house. would have computer issues, you know, in the 90s. And he would drive all the way up from Orange. He yep. goes, George, I'll be right over, you know. <laughs> he did it for me, too. Come up and help me. He was such the, a great guy. In the early days of the, of the, of the PC, uh, you know, of the IBM PCs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and those were, I mean... Yeah, he came up and reformatted things and fixed my computer hundreds of times. Yeah, when I got Windows uh, Windows 3.1, <laughs> remember that? And so, yeah, he came up and tutored me on it. You know? Oh, my. It's true. And then, you know, he, 
he was the uh, bass player in the last band that I led, which was a, a band called the Gumbo Boogie Jazz Band with Brian Shaw, Westy. Um, we had a variety of uh, Larry Giannacchini. Oh, good. I haven't talked about Larry in a long that, time. He used to sub it nuts all the time. Year and a half gig with that band at Taft Fish House and Brewery in Corona. And Westy was, you know, Westy really stepped out of his comfort zone in that band, you know, because we didn't just do Dixieland. We right. Did, you know, we did a lot of sambas and some Chick Korea tunes. And you know, <laughs> he jumped right in there, man. He had such a great ear. There are a lot of guys who came through the Knott's Berry Farm Band, which is kind of where we are now, historically speaking and, and chronologically. Right. But things, guys like Carmen Mosher, who I haven't thought of in years, and yeah, and Larry, Larry Giannacchini, yeah. and uh, I, in fact, I had interviewed John Brand. Oh, and he talked about that. He had sub for me. Of course, he and I. Uh, I think what's really mind blowing is the fact that we had Matt Fenders out there, right, subbing on two before me. If you guys don't know, Matt Fenders was the trombone player in the in Jay Leno's Tonight Show, okay. and uh, so we had some crazy people subbing on that gig that you would never expect to be subbing on that gig. I remember uh, playing playing with Matt up towards the uh, entrance. Remember when we had to go up to the entrance and play? And so we were playing up the entrance, and I was on washboard, and I got done doing a washboard solo, and Matt turns to me and he goes, you're like Dave Weckl on the washboard. Yeah, it was crazy times. In yeah, fact, you had, you had a couple of subs out there that oh, people yeah. wouldn't believe. I think Kevin Axe might have played. No, not Kevin Axe. Uh, uh, who was the drummers you had out there subbing for you? Oh, I had um, Kevin X. Is John White did it. Uh, what was his name? Kevin Tullius. That's the one I was trying to think of. Yeah, Kevin Tullius. And then the British guy. John uh, Tambori. Yeah, nice guy. Good player. Um, what's the other guy that was really, really, really a great player? I said, yeah, well, Ed Slauson did it quite a bit. Yeah. Oh, I'm just racking my memory to think of all the people that we had to go through there. It was, it was a fun gig. Oh gosh. Was Zeke Zarchi? Do you remember the time we got in trouble for attracting a crowd? Yes. <laughs> well, we got in trouble for accepting tips once at the fair. Well, we were making massive tips for a while there. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, I we were standing on our heads. You know, we were standing on our heads and, and doing everything we could. Yeah. And uh, it was, oh God, I've got some memories of the of the fair. One time we had uh, an old guy that was just kind of a, a kind of a transient who came up and started tap dancing or something with us. And I looked over at Brad and I said, "I wonder what happened to Fred Astaire." And he just lost it. He was. <laughs> <laughs> Those that was uh, that was another uh, that was another Harvey Walker thing that got us onto the fair, right? Yes, it was. Harvey got us that gig, and uh, Harvey was very influential in a lot of the stuff that I ended up doing. You know, and, for the people who are watching who don't know uh, Harvey Walker, he was one of the sons of the pioneers, right? And an incredible uh, a country fiddle player and uh, guitar and and the five string banjo, and he was our supervisor at Knott's Berry Farm. Yes, for a long time. He was, you know, when you go in, in Knott's and you see all the covered wagons? Well, back in the 60s, they had a, a, a band there called the Wagon Masters. And Harvey was in the original Wagon Masters. And of course, Dee Wollum was a gunfighter. Yeah, well, Harvey and Dee Wollum were the very first train robbers they ever had at Knott's Berry Farm when they were, when they were kids. And that's when Dee got interested in the, the quick draw. In fact, a lot of, we used to do this um, gig at the uh, uh, Phoenix Club. I think I was probably 17, 16, yeah, 17. That's the German club at Anaheim for you guys yeah. listening. And they had, a, they had a picnic area in the back. And so companies would rent it out to do their summer picnic party. And we had a, a couple of those every weekend, every Saturday, every Sandy, Sunday for quite a few years. And D would always do his quick draw and his, you know, his gun slinging tricks and stuff. So it was, you know, very entertaining. Yeah. And D Willem was the leader of the band Dixie Cats. He was a bass player, yes. but he was also the world champion quick draw, quick draw artist. Yep. So, I mean, some of the really strange connections among the people we know. He was kind of a Renaissance guy. You know, he also was a pilot. I don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't know that. Pilot. And he was a, uh, a collector of antique cars. He always had three or four Packers, he loved Packers, and he would restore them. So very interesting, interesting cat. 
Now that, that I didn't realize that. Uh, so when we got to Knott's, when we got to Knott's Berry Farm, we were there for what, eight years, six years? How long were we there? I think we were there for eight. And then I went back for two more years after we lost a gig with Pat Cloud and Dwayne Michaels. We were the uh, Knott's Berry Farm bluegrass washboard. Over the covered wagon, right? We, no, but we strolled around. So we'd okay. go over and we'd play by, uh, remember Judge War, Be Roy Beans, that little shack by the train? We'd go play on that porch and then we'd go over to Ghost Town. And you know, it was really a fun gig, you know, because we'd, we'd play like two tunes and then walk somewhere else. You know? uh, of course, our, our time there with the Barry Stump and Jazz Band yeah. was just bizarre sometimes. Oh, yes, it was. Because sitting on top of a circus wagon. Oh, boy. Especially with a sousaphone on. That was fun. Yeah. You know, and, and, uh, and we did a whole summer where they were doing a circus thing. They had a high rope walker going from one ride over to the next and uh, a full on circus marching band. And Oh, yeah. And uh, but try you guys try to play sousaphone sitting on a flat top of a circus wagon while yeah. horses were pulling it. I didn't have That's quite as big of a challenge as you did. <laughs> and, and, of, and of course, then. On top of it all, we were there with, of course, Rusty Styers and Brad Roth. Right. And uh, so we would play everything from Love Potion Number no. 9 <laughs> to Beatles tunes to traditional jazz songs from the 1900s. Right. That was, I mean, it was a pretty bizarre band, actually. It if you was look a at bizarre it, band, yeah. Which then spawned, of course, our surf band. Right. I think but, that happened where we were just tired of taking those half-hour breaks and didn't Rusty come in one day and said, Dave, why don't we sing on our breaks? Yeah, yeah. We were doing 20 minutes on, 40 minutes off because wow. of the Dolphin Show. Yep. Which uh, is another kind of odd thing to talk about. Uh, and then once once the Blasters was formed, you know, we would play out at Knott's, do our gig, and then we'd go do a firework show. Well, I talked, I talked, to, uh, I talked to one of my interviewees earlier about uh, the gig we did at the Four Seasons. Right where we showed up with all of our Dixieland instruments and they said, we wanted the surf band for the evening. You got to play piano. <laughs> I played cocktail piano for an hour. <laughs> you guys, you guys drove back and got our other equipment. And of I course I didn't you, play piano for those of you watching. Well, I remember you looked at us like <laughs> we walked in. I'm out of my repertoire. <laughs> that, but that was one of the funnier moments for that band. Yeah. Oh, some great times, and we had some great gigs. I, I don't even remember all the gigs we did, you know. I'd sit down and... I remember the last gig, which was, of course, in the City of Industry at the casino. Oh, gosh. That's right. That was the surf band. Yep. I yep. remember that. Yeah. I remember that, because Rusty called Lady in Red, and Brad got pissed that it wasn't a surf tune, and that was the end of the band. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. You know, it was sad, too, because Brad was really sounded good in that band. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. well, we, we all have a lot of fun, but we're all young and full of piss and vinegar, you know? Yeah. So after that, I ended up, uh, I did a lot of stuff after that band, too. Well, I imagine. But you and I kind of uh, more or less parted the ways because I, I went up, I ended up touring nationally and internationally with several different bands and right. misbehaving and stuff. And, and so we our ways kind of split, unfortunately, because, you know, uh, we had a great time together. You and I did. We really did. I mean, all, all four of us did, you know, and we'd take those breaks up in the, um, was it the cruise nest where we took the breaks? Or was it, was, it, it was right next to the cruise nest above the Birdcage Theater. Right. God. I wonder if that's, I haven't been out there in years. I wonder, is any of that still there? Do you know? I have no idea. I, I, I've been back there less, less frequently than you have. Yeah. Well, I've done, I did some uh, summer concerts out there. Um, all the way up until the uh, probably 2010, 2012, and uh, used uh, you know whoever I could get right. I, I, oh, sure. A lot of times the last minute, so I get Brian and uh, John Norieko did it quite a bit. But yeah, if you if you talk about the guys who who have cut away at at trying to play their instruments uh, for at least a partial living, if not if not a total living, I think a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the players who play traditional Dixieland are, are amateurs, which is what the jazz festivals were amazingly originally built for. Right, right. You know, uh, don't quite understand because a lot of them are real, you know, jazz purists yes. in their own mind. They don't realize that us guys who are out there doing it all the time, we'll play anything that pays. 
Right. I mean, I played trumpet in a salsa band for 12 years. I remember that. Yeah. You know, uh, and it was just a matter of trying to put money in the family's pocket and, yep. and you play almost anything, you know? Yeah. You don't turn down a gig, you know, because once you start turning down a gig, well, then that guy's not going to call you again. You know? Now tell me about the sense, stuff you've done since knots that I don't know about. Okay. Well, I was in a band with Ray Bush for seven years. British Connection. Was that the band? It, uh, it was called the BBC Jazz Band. Yeah, they were. They had a city at uh, Westminster Lanes, right? Yes, and we we played it. Uh, um, there was a a German club in Santa Ana called the Old Ship. You remember the Old Ship? We sure. Played there every Friday. It, and it's still we, there, I think. It's still there, and then we played it uh, every Sunday at Taps Fish House and Brewery in Brea. Now, do you remember uh, Scott Chapman? No. It was Stan Chapman's son. Okay. Yeah. And and, and, and Scott. Scott's been playing with us at Curly's. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Recently. So I was just wondering if you knew him because his dad, of course, was uh, around that area and those people. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, that name doesn't ring a bell, but um, you know, when I had the, when I had the taps gig with, with uh, uh, Ray, that was a lot of fun because we had a couple of really great guitarists that were in that band, which is unusual, you know, because the band was an okay band. But we had uh, Doug McDonald. Do you know who he is? No, I don't. He's a pretty known guitarist. He plays all over town. And then we had another guy that was really interesting. His name was Herth Martinez. And Herth was Hispanic. And he was in the 60s, he was a poet. He wrote all kinds of poets, poetry, but he also wrote a ton of songs. And in the early 70s, he was discovered by Bob Dylan. Okay. And Bob Dylan recommended him to Robbie Robertson, who was the leader of the band called The Band. So you remember The Band, right? Yes, sir. They, they were Bob Dylan's backup band. And he produced uh, Hearth's first two albums. And they're amazing. I mean, I the personnel on them, are, it's a, it, Ron Carter's the bass player, Steve Gadd's on drums on some of the tracks, Johnny Garren's on, on a bunch of the other tracks, who was Joni Mitchell's drummer. So it was a, he was a really interesting cat, and he uh, sadly passed away about four or five years ago from, from cancer. But, you know, really, I've met some, so many interesting people throughout, you know, my, oh, my yeah. playing and stuff. And, you know, trying to think of all these different stories and stuff, that because we all have stories, right? Oh, God, yes. Our experiences. I remember doing a gig. I was doing a gig in Yakima, Washington. With uh, um, I was only uh, uh, two white guys in an all black funk band. Okay. And so the waitress comes up and he goes, uh, gentlemen over at the far table invited you guys over for drinks. And so he's go over there and this guy's drunk out of his gourd and it's evil Knievel. <laughs> <laughs> bought our bought the band all, all you know as much booze as we wanted to drink that night, you know. And the next day he was jumping like fifteen cars at a fair. Oh, that's crazy. So it was really a character. Speaking yeah. of brushes with uh, with celebrities, out in Knott's Berry Farm, if you remember right, uh, anytime he would come to the park, he'd come say hello. And that was Danny DeVito. Yeah. They had and him be and his a wife and sit the kids. Yeah. And they, and they used to come by the stage every time. And, and, and you know, it makes you really get to know, um, like, another guy who uh, was a big, always came by and said hello to the band, no matter where you were, was John Voight. Right. Uh, uh, um, Angelina Jolie's dad, right? And and we would be doing the casual, and you know the certain guys would just always come up and be really kind to the band, and and Danny DeVito, of course, was one of them. There a lot of people we ended up seeing when we were knots, of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you're right. We've actually met quite a few famous musicians out there as well. One one that comes to mind is Hubert Laws. Yep. Weird Al. Weird Al. Yeah. Weird Al. You know. <laughs> Well, I won't say that. Okay, I'll leave that <laughs> off the air. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of these. There, of course, you'll see this happening in every one of the interviews where you go, ah, "No, I better not." You know, a gal that we knew out there that 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 helped set up the stage dated him. Oh yes, that I know. Yeah. That I know. Yeah. In fact, uh, we'll leave her name out of it. I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. I'm still. And if it's who I'm thinking of, I'm still in contact with with her parents. Right. Talking about uh, Camp Snoopy, our Camp Snoopy guide. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The funny. God, who, uh, man, I, there's so many things out, uh, about that gig that, 
you know, sometimes it doesn't come to mind of the ones I want to talk about. Some come to mind I don't think I should talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. I know. I know. Um, like the time, the, like the times one, one, one in, in particular person would uh, walk past the stage and you and Rusty would, would launch into da 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 Oh, yes, da, yes, da, da, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, the, speaking of which, actually, I've run, in, I've run into her a couple of times since then, too. Oh, really? Yeah. How was she doing? Uh, she uh, was dancing on cruise ships for a while. Oh, good. And ended up, uh, uh, at the time, married a stand-up comedian that, that she met on the cruise ships. We won't mention any names. But then she was, uh, she was represented, an international representative for a major cosmetics firm. Oh, really? So, good. Yeah, pretty gal. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pretty gal. So, but boy, what, what great times, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of everything else that I've done. You know, one of the things that I do now is I do all of Sharon Westenhofer's musicals. I just talked to her about two weeks ago. And okay. uh, I, yeah, yeah, I are, you gonna, are you still coming out to do those? <laughs> I have been. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I was supposed to come down in June to do Susical, but then it, it got canceled. So In fact, they just they just got done trying to do one on I guess online for video production. They just did it a dance, yeah. the dance show, and I guess it went pretty well. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I was talking to Sharon just recently. Yeah. Um, and uh, she, uh, she had a bunch of. Since we're on the air and uh, people are watching this, Sharon Westenhofer, the uh, wife of uh, past tuba player Westy Westenhofer, she has some cases she's trying to some tuba cases. She wants to try to get rid of, she maybe have already done it, but that's why she and I were talking. She wanted to oh, know if, okay. if I had contacts to sell some of that stuff. But Eric and Peter have, have, have taken the horns. Yes. Yeah, they, well, they both play too. Yes. So. Yeah, and they're, you know, it's interesting because whenever I do the, the TM, TMR shows, Peter's always there. T, Peter's the stage manager. Yeah. And, and Eric's there often, you know, doing, doing lights and stuff. And, you know, well, so I used to do private lessons out of that studio. I remember, I remember you. Yeah. Talking about that. yeah. And uh, I may again, who knows how this is going. <laughs> so. Yeah. So do I did about 12, I think I've done 12 so far out there. And the, the first one I got called for, you know how Westy is, right? Sure. So I'm eating dinner and Westy calls me up and he goes, George Westy here. What are you doing right now? And I go, I'm eating dinner. And he goes, you ever thought about doing one of those musicals with us? <laughs> And I go, well, when? And he goes, now. Uh, what, was was Ray Talbot supposed to be doing it? Pardon? Who was supposed to be doing it? There was another drummer that he had that was highly recommended that had a, he had a doctorate, I guess, in percussion. And he did the first two rehearsals, and they were at the first dress rehearsal, and Westy and Sharon just had it. And Westy fired him. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay, I didn't it, was know that. A, it was a second dress rehearsal. So I came down cold and read the book. And it was, uh, um, God, what's the name of the one that's based after Elvis Presley? Uh, oh, um, yeah, I can't bring it to mind either. I know what you're talking about. Uh, Bye Bye Birdie. Bye Bye Birdie. And Tom Hines was on guitar. I mean, it was a good band, right? Tom Hines and, and uh, uh, I can't remember who was on uh, uh, trumpet and trombone, Dave Betty does it a lot on trombone, who's uh, in the one that uh, leads the jazz uh, program at Azusa Pacific. Right. So he was on it. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I did good because I got called, I've been called for everyone since then. And oh, I remember yeah. after we did that one, Sharon came up. I didn't really know Sharon that well until then. And she came up afterwards and hugged me. <laughs> well, she's one of the best people in the world. Sharon's a sweetheart. Just yeah. a, just as a person, not a bad piano player either, of course. No, well, she does. She's amazing what she does with those kids. I mean, she, oh, yeah. it's really inspiring to watch her work with them. What's really inspiring is that after they get done with those shows, these kids just love the death out of her. You know, oh, yeah. Been, and they've actually had quite a few uh, people who've gone on to bigger and better things come out of that program. Yeah, well, I remember one time Wesley told me that um, him and Sharon went to to see uh, Cats on Broadway, and three of their previous students were in it. 
Amazing. They've had some, yeah, they've had some successful actors and actors. And we've seen a, a, a couple that, there's one gal that we're pretty sure is going to make it. She's, she's amazing. But you know, you bring up, a, a bring up an interesting point about you must have done good or they wouldn't have kept hiring you. But that brings me to the point about, because part of the show is, is for younger musicians who are, who are watching. And then I want to give them a sense of what the friendships are like and, and what the business is like. But that brings up uh, the fact that uh, alter talent isn't necessarily the best thing about getting and keeping gigs. It has to do with who you get, how you get along with people. Yeah. And whether or not you're a decent person in general, you know? Right. And if you're willing at some point to compromise on what your idea is, is in, in regards to what your contribution should be and what the person who hired you for is looking for. You know, you need yeah. to be willing to compromise, you know, what you might want to do to be able to help the other person meet their vision, you know, because clearly, you know, in that situation, they have a vision and an idea of how they want, you know, it all to sound and, you know, and, and go forth and working in a kid's theater like that, you know, you got to pay attention the whole time, you know, because <laughs> sometimes he's, the, the kid might forget a line and the piece of music might jump ahead, you know, 32 bars. <laughs> well, that happens with adults too. I mean, yeah. I've done enough musicals in the pit that, you know, you got to, you got to be ready for anything. Oh, you, know? you got to, man. You got to watch, you know, and you got to watch Sharon and, you know, and Sharon's watching those kids like a hawk. So she, cause she's been doing it for, I think they, they, they just celebrated 30 years. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a group of us uh, uh, in the early, uh, early seventies and in, in mid eighties that, uh, we were hanging out at Orange Coast College and Golden West College all the time. And one of the things they did is Dave Anthony used to run all the musicals for both of those. Yeah. He was and my so, high school band director. Yeah, I know. And Don't so really I was I was kind of the one of the trumpet players du jour back when I was playing trumpet all the time that so would do all the musicals, myself and Gary Halipoff and, oh, wow. and Ke uh, Kevin Nato was actually the keyboardist for most of those. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, in the pit. Yeah, because so I hadn't had met him until we got out at Knott's. Right, right. And of course, Kevin's a big influence at Sharon's studio, too. Oh. In fact, Kevin's wife was one of the co-owners for a long time. See, I didn't know that. I have yeah. to talk to her about that. That I didn't know. And now, and now my son's working at Orange Lutheran High School as the band director. Okay. And Kevin's the artist in residence there. So it all kind of took, you know, it all kinds of circles the same drain <laughs> at times. But I remember Kevin, Kevin used to, used to uh, direct and um, co-produce the Viber show. You know, when they had the Elvira show out at Knott's. Well, of course, he started out as being the, the, the ragtime piano player. Right. At Knott's Berry Farm. Did he? Oh, okay. So, yeah, he was the guy who he used to have a, like kind of a court con a co Coke corner thing over there by the theater oh, okay. that he started out at. Huh. And then he ended up, of course, being the composer of all the McDonald's uh, jingles. Oh, talk, interesting. You know, talk, talk about... Uh, 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 a star rising in the in the business. Yeah, yeah, he's very successful, you know. And uh, uh, one of the other drummers that was out there is quite successful. Uh, Dave Owens, Julie Owens' uh, husband. He's the drummer for um, the band that tours with the Franklin Graham Crusades. Okay. But he also did Lion King for two years at the Pantages. So he's a he's a really really great player. He's a really good friend, you know. I, I'm still in touch with. Julie and uh -huh. Harvey, and we have. How about, how about Chuck? Uh, no, he passed away. I didn't. When did that happen? I just got an email probably a month or two ago. Periwinkle Productions. That was it. Yes. Yeah, and his son's pretty successful. You know, his son. His son's a comedian, and I guess he does does pretty well. But okay. uh, yeah, Chuck passed away. Um, he was a clown. Remember at uh, Oh yeah, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. So. Yeah, he, he was another great guy to have as a supervisor on that gig, you know. He yeah, was, we did a lot of gigs for him. A lot did. of the gigs that I got, you know, that I booked on the side were booked through him, you know. We had some interesting, the side gigs were interesting. I remember one in particular we did at the Disneyland Hotel, and we showed up, and we were supposed to be a five-piece, and we were only a four-piece. Harvey booked the gig, and so I called Harvey, and I said, Harvey, what am I going to do? And he goes, don't worry, I'll come down with my fiddle. I'll be the fifth guy. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. That's the first time you guys, and you guys are both, all you guys 
Rusty, you and Brad are all cringing. Oh, no, violin player. And after the gig, you're all going, wow, that's really cool. You know Harvey. <laughs> oh, yeah, he swung his butt off. Yeah, he played really great, you know. So, um, you know, I was thinking about him the other day because um, uh, Charlie Daniels, you know, just passed away. Uh, uh, just another aside with the, is it either interesting or not, but I actually auditioned for Charlie Daniels. I didn't know that. When he did a Tex-Mex tour, they were looking oh. for a trumpet player for that tour. I, I think Frank Zabo ended up getting the gig. But uh, his uh, his manager told me that they were, I did fine as a trumpet player. I was the sound they wanted, but they wanted a trumpet player who could do a little short skit as a flamenco dancer. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding and me? And I didn't quite have the body style. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, well, you missed you missed that one, I guess. I know. That that was when he was releasing Devil Goes Down in Georgia. Yeah. Well, that's where I was going with the story with Harvey. He Charlie Daniels um, headlined out at the John Wayne Theater before they changed it to the Good Time Theater. Right. And uh, he brought Harvey up, and they did, a, they did a violin duel on The Devil Goes Down to Georgia. Yeah. yeah. Harvey held his own, I guess. So. Oh, I would imagine. I didn't get to see it, but I talked to several people that, that, that saw it. So have you found anybody to play with there in Arizona? Um, I've gone out since I've been here, and I've sat in with two bands, and I'm making waves. So I got on the – after the first band I sat in with, as I was driving home, the sax player who's the leader of the band called me in my car to go down and play with the college big band. Okay. So, and in the big band, you know, it's interesting. It's like a oh, lot of- What city are you in? I'm sorry. I'm in Prescott. Okay. Prescott, Arizona. So we actually live in Prescott Valley, but um, all the gigs that are happening in town are in Prescott. And so it's a swing band, you know, the, the band that I sat in with, and they were very impressed. The drummer called me up. He goes, you want to come in and play a tune? And I came up and I played the first tune. And he goes, why don't you just finish out the set? <laughs> uh, ended up playing the playing the whole set with them, and uh, so I've gone and, and played with the big band. That's fun. And then there you are cool. stealing gigs again. No, there's a huge yeah. Disneyland community, of course, uh, out there. Yes, there is. In fact, they're um, they do a summer concert, and I was going to actually text you when when I went to it because the guest star at it it was right in Prescott. The guest star was Howard Alden. I I just interviewed Howard. Oh, you did? Yeah, two days ago. Yeah, yeah great. Because he's on that album with you on um, uh, with the Southern Comfort Jazz Band. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's he's phenomenal. Of course, he his. I was uh, I did research on him, and one of the articles said the only question about Howard Alden is whether or not he's one of the best guitar players in history, or he's the best guitar player in history. Oh wow, interesting. <laughs> I think that was Downbeat or one of those magazines that huh. said that. Yeah, he's a terrific player. You know, and uh, and he sounded great. You know, at that at at, at the concert, and he's so, still playing banjo on occasion. So, oh, he didn't play it there on that yeah. one. He just played guitar, but yeah. Did he play exclusively banjo on the Southern Comfort album, or did he also play guitar? No, see that album was a little bit funny. If you don't mind me taking a little side note here to talk about it, uh, we had uh, two different. We had actually three different reed players go through that band, and two different guitar players. Um, Howard was on the audition tape we did for Southern Comfort, and uh, when we actually toured uh, Florida and so we went to the contest itself, Denny Hardwick was oh, our guitar player. Oh, okay. And then on reeds, we started out with Mark Curry from the Jazz Miners on clarinet, and Bill Liston was always there on tenor, sax, but when uh, Bob Reitmeyer uh, couldn't make it, I mean, when Mark Curry couldn't make it, Bob Reitmeyer did the England tour with us. Oh, interesting. And so when we did the album, we had everybody on it. We actually had a virtual big band. Oh, wow. Okay. For that I album. I didn't know that. That's so. how that came about. Interesting. Yeah, that's why, that's why you have three reads on, on a Dixieland album. <laughs> that's a great album. And Els Lawson, of course, was playing drums. And yeah. Dan, yeah. And Dan Barrett and Brian Shaw. I really miss Ed. It's, I actually found it on, uh, for sale on eBay. Oh, you did? That that album, yeah, I think it's all worth of all worth worth of like thirty six dollars or something. But oh, jeez, you have you have have a copy, I'm sure, still, right? You know, my sister, my older my older sister, passed several years ago, but her husband just passed a couple years ago, oh. and my wife has been up there helping close out the account, and they found an almost pristine copy of it. Oh wow, crazy! Within her within her files, wow. is that so? 
I mean, it's, you're right. It's a great album. Yeah, um, it really is. I was, I was, it was my, that was my very first Dixieland band. So I was a baby in the woods compared to the old. Yeah, those that guys. was a great band, uh, Dan Barrett, and I think he's over in Europe still. I heard that he went over there to recently. Well, Dan moved his whole family, I think, up to Oregon here recently. Oh, they did. And he's been he's been back. You know, he was at the back of the park for a while. For yeah, about I knew two that. years. He was, he was back playing at the back with, the, with Rusty, right? Yeah, yeah, with a jambalaya brass or jambalaya uh -huh. jazz band. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, now he's going back to doing international festivals again and. Yeah, good. I've been trying yeah. to get him to, to come on and do an interview, but uh, I haven't gotten him to respond yet. Oh, yeah. How about Larry Wright? Larry just refused. Really? Yeah. He's he, a great one to do. Although that. I play with him all the time, uh, his comment to me was, nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Oh, I do. <laughs> every, he's come up in every interview. Yeah. In every interview I've done, and I've probably done uh, maybe nine or ten already, and right. I have another 20 to go on my list. But Larry Wright and Westy have come up on all on every interview. Yeah, they yeah very yeah. you know very known guys in that idiom. I mean, and Hal Smith has come up on almost everyone. Yeah, he yeah, but well, uh, Larry is just you know so good on so many different instruments in that idiom. It's, on he's on great, every instrument, great drummer. I mean, he play. I, he did the first Jim Ziegler album, and he does some really neat stuff, man. On the, yep. In fact, in fact, I Jim Ziegler and I were talking about when I interviewed him that I actually designed their first uh, the first cassette cover and his business cards. Oh, you did. Beginning. I so. didn't know that for the swing stations, right? Yes, the swing yeah. stations, and they're still around. They're still Tom Hines is playing guitar for him. Yeah. I've subbed in it quite a bit. Oh yeah, I've, I so I've seen. It. Yeah, I subbed in subbed in that band quite a bit when I was in California. Jimmy's a pretty incredible guy too, you know. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's a really super nice guy too. One of Listen, the, I, it's about time I need to start wrapping us up. Okay. Well, it's it's been fun talking to you. Yeah, you, you too, Dan. The day you surprised me coming out to SPDJ, the the, the jazz club was just a kick in the pants. Oh yeah, that was fun. And uh, and of course. Uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody's asking when you're going to come back. And I'm saying, well, next time he's in town to visit a sister or something, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, she's two blocks away. <laughs> well, that makes it convenient. I, mean, I can pretty much walk there. But of course, there are clubs down right now, you know. So, yeah. So, all I, right, George. All right, Dan. So I hope well, we can do so this again soon. You. When you're out here doing something for Sharon, so give me a call. We'll have dinner. I will do so. Maybe we can get together with Sharon and, and do breakfast or something. I think that'd be wonderful. Okay, thanks for having me, Dan. And oh, you're welcome. It's been yeah. fun. Let me know if it's ever on. <laughs> no. It will. We, we let everybody know right before uh, we drop the videos when it's going to come on. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's a lot more we could have talked about. I was going to tell some stories. <laughs> well, we, you know, there may be opportunity for that in the future, but um, I'm trying to keep these right around an hour, you know. Okay, so. I got it. Okay. The, I was just going to tell you the story with Chuck and the nudist colony, but we'll, I guess we could do that some other okay, time. I can wait. Okay, so I got called to do this gig with D. Wollum, and we show up at the gig, and they don't tell me anything about the gig at all. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I show up there, and Chuck goes, it's a nudist colony. And I go, what? And he goes, yeah, you got to take your clothes off. And Chuck starts taking the shirt off, and he goes, man, that sun's going to feel great on my, you can fill in the blank. Right, and I got so nervous. And when I when we went in there to play, the band didn't have to dress, but it was a nudist colony. Everybody in the, <laughs> everybody in the whole audience, and two of the guys that were in the band were naked. <laughs> anyway, well, see, there now you the, go. Good way to close. The the Red Hot Chili Peppers don't seem so strange now, do they? No, they do not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thanks. Thank you for that story. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Yeah, it was great. Uh, miss miss so many guys. You know, I went I went through a list of guys that we had played with out at Knots that aren't with us anymore, and I got to forty. Neil Lambert. Neil Lambert. Jerry Burns. Zeke. I mean, yeah. I, I I went through, I wrote them all down. So it was astonishing, but great times, great memories, and and you know, always enjoy playing with you. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to do it again too. Oh, I hope so. You take care now. Okay, you too. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all for watching Trad Jazz today with Dan Zeilinger. Make sure you subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Videos come out every Wednesday and Friday.